Well, hello and welcome to our online experience. We are so excited that you're joining with us today. We believe that today is gonna to be so life-changing and so beneficial for so many people, yourself included. But listen, before we get going, do me a couple of favors. First, be active in the comments. While we're watching together, we wanna to engage with you and connect with you. So first challenge, be in the comments and let us know where you're watching from. Second challenge though, is make sure that you share this stream. Like I said, we believe that today is gonna help impact your life, but that also you can be the catalyst of change to bring that to other people as well, simply by sharing. So with that, let's jump into today's worship experience. Hey, good morning, Rust City Church. My name is Nathan. I wanna share with you a quick principle of something I found inside your Bible. It's in Exodus chapter 16. It's the story of the children of Israel, the nation of Israel. They've left Egypt in bondage and they've made their way through the Red Sea and God's delivered them and they find themselves now in a wilderness moment, uh, but they're starting to run out of food. They start to complain to God. They say, hey, you could have left us in bondage. You could have left us in Egypt and we would have died, but at least our bellies would be full. And so God responds, he says, all right, well, I'll, I'll provide for you. I will rain down bread from heaven. And so what God would do is he would send a dew and it would, uh, it would cover the ground in the morning and when it would dry, it would become these flakes that they could gather together and make, make bread out of. They could gather together and make a uh, meal and food out of. And so he gave them specific instructions. He said to take as much as you need. Don't take any more, don't take any less. Use whatever you gather, make sure you use it uh, in, in that day. Don't keep any of it overnight, just what you need for the day. And thirdly, gather two days worth on the day before the Sabbath so that you don't have to work on the Sabbath and gather. 
And there were many that would. They would be obedient to what he instructed. They would be responsible and handle it all the way that he instructed them. But there were those that would, uh, wouldn't would gather enough or would gather too much. And uh, then there were those that would try to keep it overnight. And it's interesting that in the morning that there would be worms and maggots and a terrible smell coming uh, from what they had gathered because it had rotted. And then there were those that wouldn't gather what they needed for the Sabbath. And so then they would go the entire Sabbath and be hungry. And God's response to them is, why do you refuse to obey? It, 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 he gave them manna, but he expected them to be responsible with it and to be obedient, uh, handling it. Uh, it. When they did, it was something that sustained them. But when they didn't, it was something that, that became a burden and became a problem to them. God has given us everything, and that includes our finances. And when we, when we mishandle what God gives us, it becomes a problem. But when we are handling it responsibly and obediently, however, it's something that sustains us, not something that drains us. You can't buy God. You, that's not what I'm trying to convey with, with your obedience, but your obedience can open up the opportunity for Him to operate in your life. I wanna challenge you right now, in a wilderness season, at the end of 2020, I will challenge you to see if your obedience to Him truly will open up an opportunity for Him to operate in your life. There's many ways that you can give right now. The two easiest by far, uh, you can text the amount that you wanna give to the number 84321. If it's your first time, follow the on-screen prompts. Uh, since we're all online right now, you can actually just click the link uh, in the chat there in the comments below. Uh, you can click that and that'll lead you to a separate page where you can give securely and safely right there. Before we give, I, I, I do wanna make sure that you have a moment where you can type in any prayer request, uh, any prayer need that you have, leave it there in the comments. And we have people, we have a team that's standing by to pray and agree with you for whatever your needs are. I'm gonna pray over the offering and pray for you and then we'll continue with our worship experience. Father, we say that this is the day that you have made, so we choose to rejoice and be glad in it, knowing that in our lives you are doing all things well. Uh, we say that you are our provider, and so with everything that you've given us, we want to handle it responsibly, and we want to be obedient to what you've commanded us to do. We bring back the tithe and give it to you, 10% of what you've given us. We give it back to you cheerfully, thanking you that you're opening up the windows of heaven and pouring out a blessing we will not have room enough to receive. Father, for every prayer request, we thank you that you're meeting us at our point of need and that you are an ever-present help in time of need. In Jesus' name, amen. Love is better than all the others. 
When I was a kid, I remember being a pretty happy, energetic kid, but I remember from a very young age a lot of turmoil, a lot of pain. So I was in a place where I didn't have a very good relationship with my parents. I had a hope that our relationship would start to mend, but that hope didn't last very long. When I was a senior in high school, my mom got diagnosed with stage 4 colon cancer. It was just a moment where life just fell apart at the seams. She was only sick for a year before she ended up passing away. From that point, I started to spiral for a very long time. And then on a random Tuesday afternoon, my dad had a major heart attack and he ended up passing away. Life got very crazy and my emotions started to just spiral out of control. I barely left my room. I was lashing out on the people that cared about me. I almost didn't want to be happy anymore. So I started to kind of live in it. And I did that for about two years. I didn't want to reach out for help, but I knew that I needed it. So I decided one day that I needed something and something needed to change. So I was at work one night and my boss decided to bring her recovery girls to a revive night and she asked me to bring her daughter. I kind of decided that I could do one of two things. I could go in there and just be who I've always been and not let it impact my life or I could let my guard down see what this whole church thing was all about, see if something could change my heart. I started to feel hope. I started to feel like, okay, like there's something more for me. So I went for it. I decided to join Rusty College. Within the first semester and a half, I started to come alive again. I started to find purpose. I started to follow after my relationship with God and just chase after what He wanted for my life. My first semester was not exactly easy, but leaning in and learning more about myself and God and I can now go to that foundation of faith that I have. My biggest takeaway from this season is that I can have hope for my, my purpose and my family, that God has everything under control and that God hears me, he's there for me, he's listening. Because I don't know what the rest of my life looks like, but I know I can trust God and that I can trust in his purpose for my life. And that even when things aren't going my way, that I can just trust in what he is doing in my life. Well, hey, good morning, Rust City. If you don't know me, my name is Brad. I'm a teaching pastor here. Super excited that you guys are joining us for the very first experience of 2021. First off, let me say congratulations for all of us who made it to 2021. I know that some of you thought that you wouldn't, so go ahead and type in the chat, we made it. Sometimes you just gotta celebrate that, man, we made it to another season and God is good and has been good through all of it. But hey, I'm super excited today because we are diving into a new series called Things I Wish Jesus Never Said. I don't know about you, maybe you're better than me, but oftentimes I read through the Bible, I see the commands of God, the challenges of Jesus, and I stop and I pause and I think, man, my life would be a heck of a lot easier if Jesus wouldn't have said what he just said right there. Oftentimes I find that tension in life as well. It's like this, for example, my wife, Lydia, all she wants is a dog. She was super disappointed because Christmas just came and Christmas just passed and she did not get one, but she has been on this dog kick. Uh, maybe one of the reasons is because everyone at church, church people are crazy. And if you're watching this and you go to this church, that means that you are probably crazy. All they ever ask is, when are you gonna have kids? When are you gonna have kids? When are you gonna have kids? Me and Lydia, we have done the best that we can do to put off kids as long as we can. So one of our compromises is, well, maybe we can get a dog. It, Lydia was talking to me about it one day. She said, can we get a dog? Can we get a dog? Can we get a dog? And kind of just to get her to stop talking about it, to appease her, I said, we can think about it. How many people know? 
if you have a spouse, that is all that your spouse needs to run with it. I said, we can think about it. She heard, absolutely, yes, we're getting a dog ASAP. So now we'll be going on walks around the neighborhood. Every time we see a dog, Lydia's like, is this the time that we're finally going to get a dog? Uh, every single night, I, I find myself at the house. She's scrolling through Google, showing me this dog, showing me that dog. And what I'm finding is, what I thought was gonna cost hundreds of dollars is actually going to cost thousands of dollars. But she is hooked on this idea that she wants a dog. And I think back to that moment where I said, I'll think about it. And you know the tension that I feel? Man, I really wish that I wouldn't have said that. Why is that? Because now that I said it, I'm accountable to take action. A lot of times that's how God works in the Bible. How often do we see Jesus say something and because he said it, before I heard it, my life was easy. But now that I heard it, I'm accountable to take action. It was more comfortable before I knew it, but now that I know it, I feel convicted and I feel challenged. But here's what the Bible says in the book of Matthew chapter seven, verse 24. It says, anyone who listens to my teachings and follows it is wise like a person who builds a house on solid rock. What we have to realize about the things that Jesus says and the things that the Bible teaches is maybe we don't get it, but that doesn't mean that we don't still need it. I mean, maybe it makes us uncomfortable, but that doesn't mean that it's not still foundational to our lives. God is a God who always has our best interests in mind. So even when he makes us uncomfortable, we can have confidence in the fact that he is leading us on the path that is best for us as his children. Right? When I look at the Bible, I think of this tension. Man, I wish Jesus wouldn't have said it. And I think of a particular story in the book of Matthew chapter 28. And where we're gonna pick up in this story, Jesus has just died on the cross. He's went to the grave. He's defeated death. He's rose again. He's done something that nobody else has ever done. And his disciples, inevitably, they're pumped up about it. The whole entire time that Jesus walked this planet, his disciples actually had a misconception about who he was. He was talking about how he was gonna be the Messiah, how he was gonna save the world. And they were experiencing severe political oppression from the Roman government. So this whole entire time, they thought Jesus that was Jesus was going to be a political Messiah. So now the fact that he's died and he's rose again, they're looking at him and they're like, Jesus, you are the most powerful person on the face of this planet. They think that he is going to free them from their political struggles. Uh, in our context, they think that Jesus is about to take the throne, take the seat of the Oval Office, and he is going to free our government and our nation from all of this craziness. But we know that Jesus, he didn't come to establish a political kingdom. He came to establish a spiritual kingdom. He came to establish a kingdom that started in the hearts of man and that we then went and we carried that authority and we distributed it to the rest of the world. It's a kingdom that revolves around our belief in God and the love that he has for us. And the disciples, they don't understand this. And they see Jesus in all of this power. And he calls him up on a mountaintop right before he's about to ascend up into heaven. And they think that it's going to be this celebratory moment. They think he's going to take his throne. But here's what Jesus says in Matthew 28, verse 19 through 20. It says, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all of the commands I have given to you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of age. And the disciples, they find themselves in this moment because they think that they're about to have a party because Jesus is coming into power. And all of a sudden they leave this encounter with Jesus and it feels like he had just given them a chore. It feels like he had just given them something else to do, something that they were probably afraid of, something that they weren't anticipating. And they find themselves in this moment of, Jesus, I really wish that you wouldn't have said that. Like, I know that you want us to go out and you want us to build the church and you want us to make disciples, but I really wish that you wouldn't have called us to action. Because now that you called us to action, we're accountable to it. What is it that Jesus is actually asking the disciples to do? We break down his command. The first thing that he said was go. 
In other words, he's telling the disciples, hey, you have to get off of the couch. You have to step out of your comfort zone because faith requires discomfort. How many people know that the Bible says faith without action is dead? So it's one thing to have faith, but your faith is not proven legitimate until you actually act upon it. So Jesus is saying, the faith that you have in me, you stuck by my side for the last two and a half years, you followed me, you witnessed my death on the cross, you witnessed my resurrection from the grave. I'm gonna need you to take that faith and actually do something about it. So the first thing that you need to do is go. But where are they going? They're going to make disciples. What is a disciple? Disciple is simply a, a fancy word for followers. He was looking at his disciples and telling them to go and make other disciples they would have understood what a disciple was. They were men who not only followed Jesus, but they gave up everything to follow Jesus. When Jesus is teaching uh, during his ministry and the disciples were listening, he said, blessed are people who they've left mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers and houses and property to follow me. A disciple wasn't someone who just followed Jesus nonchalantly. A disciple was someone who was willing to give up everything to follow him wherever he said it was that they needed to go. So I need you to go and I need you to make more followers in the same way that you follow me, teach other people to do the same. So what does discipleship look like? The first thing you're gonna do is you're going to baptize people. This word baptism, they would have known that it represented conversion. Whenever someone gave their life to Jesus in this time, the first thing that followed was baptism. Salvation and baptism were synonymous and they knew what baptism represented. In Romans 6, 4, it talks about baptism like this. It says, just as you died and were buried with Christ through baptism, in the same way that he was raised to new life by the glorious power of the Father, you also may live new lives. So baptism was this monumental moment in someone's life where this spiritual and supernatural shift happens where the old me is gone. The old me is dead. The sinful me, spiritually speaking, is no more. The broken me, supernaturally speaking, is no more. Jesus took care of that on the cross and I don't have to carry that around anymore. And because the old me is gone, I can now live like Jesus. I can now live new life. Jesus goes on to say, here's how you're going to teach them how to live new life. Teach them my commandments. Teach them how to live. They became children of God but because they've never lived as children of God, you have to teach them how to live this thing out. How many people know if we aren't discipled by the word, we'll be discipled by the world. And Jesus is saying the world tries to teach us to live in ways that are manipulative. The devil, Jesus refers to as the ruler of this world. And he's also referred to and identified in the Bible as the father of lies. So if we're being discipled by the world, we're going to live in a web of lies and not even know it. In order to combat the ways of the world, we have to teach people the ways of the word. And this is the challenge that he's giving to his disciples, saying, you are my disciples, now go out and make disciples, convert people, lead them to salvation. And then once they've been saved, teach them how to live as my followers. Teach them what I say in my word. And the disciples, they're experiencing this moment. And I can just imagine if I was there, right? Because it's like, Jesus, I, I get that you're calling us to go and do this, but why don't you just do it? I mean, after all, you were the one for the last two and a half years during your ministry that you opened up blind eyes. It, 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 when the deaf came into contact with you, they could hear again. You were the one that raised people who were dead back to life again. You are the one who has all the power. You are the one who is in control. Why are you asking us to do what you could obviously just do yourself? You've already done it, just keep on doing it. But here's what you have to realize about God. In our relationship with him, will become a lot more understandable when we get this in our brains. When it comes to God's purpose, he rarely does for himself what he can do with us. He rarely does for himself what he can do with us. I mean, look at the Old Testament when God's chosen people, the Israelites, they were being chased by the Egyptians and they were cornered by the Red Sea. God was going to split the Red Sea for them, which was something that in his miraculous power, only he could do. But what did he say to Moses, who was their leader? He said, raise your staff and split the Red Sea. He asked Moses to play a part. What do you say when he brought Jesus into the world? 
Uh, he could have brought Jesus into the world any way that he wanted to. He could have teleported him straight from heaven, but he chose a virgin teenage girl named Mary. He said, you will give birth to a son and you will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. He rarely does for himself what he can use us for. He is not a leader who is just a doer. God is a leader who is a delegator. In other words, he's not just going to do everything by himself, even though he can do everything by himself. He thinks enough about us that he actually wants to partner with us. He's not just a doer, he's a delegator. So the tension is, God, why do you delegate to me what you could do for yourself? Maybe it's because God knows that there is growing in the going. Whenever he calls me to go, it's synonymous with my growth. In fact, I cannot grow unless I go. Every time that I go and I pray for somebody in faith or I tell somebody about Jesus or I bless somebody with generosity or I do life with someone and I play the long game and the long journey of sharing the love of Jesus with them. Every time that I choose to go, my faith grows, my trust grows, my capacity for God and the things of God grow but my capacity cannot grow as long as I'm sitting on the couch. My capacity cannot grow as long as I stay within my comfort zone. And Jesus is giving this challenge to the disciples and this challenge to us. You need to go and make disciples of all of the world. And the question for us becomes, because I get it, this is my type of personality. God, I know that you want me to go, but now if I'm being honest, I'm feeling a little bit of a pressure to perform. You want me to do the things that you did. The Bible even says that we will do even greater things than you did when you were on this planet. But I don't know how to do that. Like, I don't have the power to do that. I'm just an ordinary guy. If I'm being honest with you, I don't even feel all that talented most of the time. And you're wanting me to do supernatural things. But Jesus answers his own tension in his response when we look back at the scripture. Let's read it one more time. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. It says, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority. Type in the chat, all authority. I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of age. So in the middle of Jesus' speech, in the middle of his last words before he leaves this planet, we know that he's going to challenge us as his disciples to go and make other disciples. But let's look at what that challenge is surrounded by. First, he starts by saying, I, Jesus, have been given all authority, therefore. In other words, because I have been given all authority, that's the authority that you are able to go and act upon. And then after he gives the challenge, after he gives the command, it says, be sure of this, I am with you always. In other words, here's the assurance that we have. Jesus's command to go is surrounded by his authority and his accessibility. He wants to partner with us, but he does not put a pressure on us to perform. He doesn't pressure us to perform, rather he gives us an invitation to partnership. So it's not on your own ability, it's not on your own strength, it's not on your own knowledge, it's not on your own ability to be able to do miracles. That ability lies within me. But what you need to do is you need to give me access. And when you do, you receive my authority. You receive accessibility to me. You can have me always, whenever you want, whenever you go, be sure that my power is with you and my presence is with you. And when we do that, when we step into that type of partnership, that's when we can see the kingdom of heaven come to pass on this earth, like Jesus talks about in his word. So I just wanna challenge you. And 2020 was a year that really said slow. What if 2021 is a year where God is saying go? I think of when Jesus was talking to his disciples about the church and here's what he said, to not even the power of hell will be able to stand against it. It is so easy to get passive when it comes to church to say, well, maybe somebody else will do it or to rely on programming or to rely on the property on which the church building stands. But can I tell you, the church is not about property and the church is not about programming. The church is about people. And regardless of if this year was as crazy as last year or not, the command of Jesus does not change to go and make disciples. When the foundation of the world is shaken, 
Jesus' command still holds true. So I just wanna challenge you. What does it look like if I give access to his authority? And I said, Jesus, I have a confidence that you're with me always. So by your power, I'm going to go. Let's 2021 be a year when we don't stop reaching people, but we go after God's best that's still ahead of us. Let me pray for you. Jesus, we come to you and I thank you so much for every single person. And we also, even though it's challenging, we thank you for your command to go. We just release your authority in the name of Jesus and your accessibility in the name of Jesus. And we just pray that as your disciples, we can go out this year and we can make more disciples than we ever have before, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them not the ways of the world, but the ways of the word. It's all in your name we pray, amen. Children, their 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 children, their